all my turns has set me up to be at this point where I'm at today. Right. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Through, you know, the music and the challenges of, you know, and the grit it takes to be in the music business, right? To get, get into MLM and the grit and, um, and the commitment it takes to do that. To the structure of being in the nine to five and, um, you know, learning how to formalize emails and be professional and stuff like that. Um, work spreadsheets and Microsoft tools and, you know, all those things that people you know, may take for granted, you know what I mean? But when you are doing your business, the less you know, the more you pay for it. Before we get into this episode, I know you've been struggling with the idea of starting your own business and launching a premium product that you know is gonna transform lives. So I have a bomb resource for you. The man himself, Words Taylor, is going to help you launch your product or service for the clients who need your help right now. Now you can't call yourself a business owner unless you are getting in front of new clients every single day, and Words knows exactly how to do that. All you have to do is tap in so he can teach you his six-figure launch strategy that's produced over $5 million in client sales. So all you have to do is go to highticketlaunchsecrets.com. That's highticketlaunchsecrets.com and get into the free training. It's happening this week. So go to highticketlaunchsecrets.com and let's get into the episode. Welcome to the Work and Play Podcast, everybody. I am your host, Arielle Young, and I have a pretty dope guest here. I'm kind of excited to like dive into your story a little bit because your, your personality is like super chill. But you got a lot of cool things going on. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get into your brand a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and get into the mind of a businessman who may or may not see value in content creation. So <laughs> <laughs> we gotta talk about all of that. Um, but without yeah. further ado, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey guys, I'm uh, Kevin John, co-founder of Island John Vodka, family brand. My dad and I started a few years ago. Um, we're in Georgia, Florida, New York, Texas, and just landed in California. Um, but a uh, husband, father of two little boys, and uh, in trenches, man. In the trenches. In trenches. Yeah. So, well, we got to get into what you mean by in the trenches, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, I'm, in a, I'm in a space as an entrepreneur where a lot of infopreneurs, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm around a lot of infopreneurs. So, what's really dope is that you have Island John brand, which okay. is a product based brand, okay. but it's also on a larger scale. Like, you guys are trying to go national, I'm, I'm sure eventually international. Eventually, yeah. yeah. Um, so the story of you building a like alcoholic beverage brand, mm -hmm. right? Um, and wanting to whatever visions you guys have for it, that's actually pretty dope. Yeah. So um, my dad, who is in Germany right now, he's just been texting via WhatsApp. Um, he shared with me back in 2014 a project that he's been working on, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know. Probably around November of 2014, he sent me these samples of Island John. They were in a black bottle, green letters that went vertically up the bottle. It was Island John Vodka or Island John Premium Career Vodka, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he designed it, you know, it was kind of his uh, uh, way to, his creative release to do some of the packaging, package design on that. So I was like, cool, my dad's in the alcohol space. Um, you know, I think the most I seen in the bank was a Guinness. But um, my nightlife preference was always vodka. So Grey Goose was my go-to. Okay. You know, vodka cranberry, if I want to get creative, throw a splash of pineapple juice in there, you know, be cool. But, um, but uh, you know, 2015 came around, and I just started inquiring about that what's going on with the brand, which, you know, and it just kind of opened a gate of disgruntles. And so I was like, well, let me see how I can help. Mm -hmm. So I just told him to send me as many bottles as you can as possible. And I put a small team together and we put on an event in the Highlands. Um, Highlands? Uh, Midtown. Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. serious. Okay, gotcha. Well, yeah. there's your so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Midtown Highlands. Um, and so uh, I told the guy that, like, yeah, we're going to bring in like 100 people, whatever the case is, and form a show up. Right. So it's just. It was just on a uh, a short runway of trying to curate this event, mm -hmm. um, but really um, we got some good feedback on it, um, and we were able to put together some content and video, um, some impressions, and we packaged it all up. And my dad had like a business team he was working with out in Germany at the time, so um, 
the idea was to really kind of get them on board and try and see if they wanted to fund the U.S. with the Island of John project. So we did that, and uh, they didn't seem too enthusiastic about it. So, they didn't. Mm-mm. No, we got so they invested, but they didn't necessarily seem like invested in the brand. Well, specifically for U.S., but um, there was no real launch in Europe for it at all. It's still very conceptual type thing. Um, and, uh, and it was really just a way to show them that there could be some potential here in the U.S. And if you know the alcohol space, um, vodka takes up about 30, 35, 36% of all bottles. Okay. Right. So it's a big chunk of the pot. So, um, so from that point, um, I just, I told my dad, I was like, Hey, you still own the Island John name and, you know, let's see. Let's see what we can do with it, you know. Uh, in my naiveness, <laughs> I said that, right? In my greenness, I said that. Instead of just being more intentional, really kind of learning about the space before I was like, hey, we could do this, you know, it's alcohol. I don't come from a beverage background. Yeah. Right? So I, I, mean, have I, no, I, I hate have to no interrupt your story. No, go ahead. But I feel like that is the entrepreneurial <coughs> spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. We, we jump and, in. Yeah. At first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, I have so many questions, but continue with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I just really got intrigued about um, one, my dad and I going into business together, mm-hmm. starting a family brand, starting a family business, creating some kind of legacy that has never, from my opinion, and knowing my family has never really been part of my family, right? So mm-hmm. um, us going down this process to do that. Um, and then as I dive deeper in the alcohol space, that there's been a lot of other families since Prohibition, before Prohibition, that have started these family brands, right? Mm-hmm. You go all the way down from Jack Daniels to um, – to Angel's Envy, which is more of a newer bourbon. Um, it's a lot of different brands, right? But um, they all come from a heritage, right? And it could be geographically here in the U.S. or around the world, right? It all comes from a, from a family that started that that uh, that brand, that business. So I just saw it as an opportunity for us to, you know, to see what we could do. Yeah. And um, I just started kind of self-educating myself about the whole business, Googling and everything possible. Um, talking to different vendors mm-hmm. out there from glass vendors to, I tell people it takes about five to six vendors to make out, make one bottle. Like one bottle? Make one bottle. So yeah. what's the process of <clears throat> making a bottle of Ivan John? Um, the process is, um, well, you have, we have to have the glass, mm-hmm. right? So that's the vendor, mm-hmm. right? We do a decoration of a partial frost on our bottle and then we have a gold plant on it as well. All right, just kind of. Bring, um, bring that splash to the packaging. And um, then we do a label, right? So that's three. We do a label, we have a capture, then we have a cork. Mm-hmm. We have a cork for bottle, then we have a plastic capsule, a tamper capsule. So when the buyer goes in the store and they see a plastic capsule on there, they open it up or they actually pop the cork. So you got that, and then we have the liquid. How many is that? That's five, I feel like. We, I just hit yeah, the yeah. we hit five. five. Or six, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, now, do you guys, when it comes to supplier diversity, do you guys like make sure you're hiring? Like, you know how we're, <laughs> we're definitely in a more conscious era. We are. And I don't know how many black, you know, cork makers there are, or glass yeah, fosters. Zero. Zero. <laughs> yeah. Because historically, we've never really had a chance at business in general. Yeah. Right? But especially in this space. Mm-hmm. So even if you want to, or do you guys ever try, or is that a first thought? Well, our master blender's black. Mm. His name's Theo, Theo Jones, mm-hmm. um, Theodore Jones. Um, yeah, man, dude comes from the hood. But um, you will never see any other person like him in this space. Mm-hmm. Um, grilled out, yeah. you know what I mean? But super cool, about like 50-something years old. Mm-hmm. But um, super cool, knows his stuff, very knowledgeable, been in the business for 20-something years. So you guys are teaching. He had, he came. With yeah, 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 for sure. So um, we are very fortunate to um, to run into Theo. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah. So and um, he's someone I want to get on camera and have him be able to tell his story. And because I think he has so much. And I told him this. I'm like, dude, 
you have so much to give to your community just from a from an optics standpoint. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just like like you're <clears throat> in you're in the liquor business and you're black and you're grilled out and you right. know how to blend. It's not sometimes yeah. we think of distribution. We think right. when we think of people in our community, we think of the typical roles. Yeah. And yeah. so he can be a whole He's behind outfit. the scenes. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, you know. He's behind the scenes. He he knows his stuff. He knows how to, you know, um, blend bourbon barrels. He knows how to do gin. Yeah. You know, vodka, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's a I feel like he's a real force to be reckoned with, man. Mm -hmm. He's gonna get you out there for sure. So. Since I've been podcasting, I actually realized there's so many dope people in this world, <laughs> and whether they end up on my couch or not. <laughs> Uh, some people who would love to be on the couch, mm -hmm. they don't, they're not comfortable with sharing their story yet, or they feel right. like it's not enough of their story for people to be like, to connect with. Sure, sure. But through like doing podcasts and really like mm -hmm. hearing so many cool stories, I feel like there's someone who needs to hear your story. There's always that oh, one, yeah, one person sure. who needs to hear Absolutely, story. I agree. And I so, agree. speaking of your story, I'm thinking about the, the um, point at which you said, I could have done more research if I was thinking about it. I would have done more research, but I just said naively mm -hmm. said, "Hey, Dad, let's take this brand and make it bigger, <laughs> right?" And I think that I feel like it's a catalyst of sorts, right? right? But your mindset, I'm not sure what it was at the time. So I think that's a good place for us to dig in, right? So mm -hmm. when you told him this, what was your career at the time? Great question. I was. Uh... I was in telecommunications, so I was working for a studio. So we were very niche in how we went to market. We did uh, voiceovers specifically for telephony platforms. Mm. Right. So like we, movie phone? No. So um, oh yeah. So it could be movie phone. Mm -hmm. Um, so like IMDb or whatever. Got yeah. you. So when you call up, you, but we weren't. Uh, those were kind of flash and pan type. More. We were more corporate. So. Okay. Um, Dealing with more of your Fortune 500, such as HP, Oracles, your big insurance um, agencies, such as Aetna. So when you call them up and you have to go through a prompting application before you get to an email, mm -hmm. um, or even a banking app, right? You call your bank and it's like, so. That's one. Yeah, yeah, for all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the that was the core business, okay. right? Um, and then we did that in over 100 languages and dialects around the world because mm -hmm. it's several multinational companies. So. Um, I started off on the production side um, of the house. Um, my background background toward that was music. Um, really? Production, music engineer. I went to Full Sail um, after I got my uh, degree at uh, Georgia Military for Business mm -hmm. there. And then um, I needed my life to be a little stable at some point. You know what I mean? Just ripping and running, chasing the whole music dream and aspirations, right? Yeah. But, um, at some point, you I was said like, right, but I don't know. We don't know what your your music aspirations were. <laughs> what, were you trying to be like uh, what's his name, Timberland? Or yeah, I was trying, trying to, to be all the time? guys. I was trying to be all Timberland, Swiss Beats. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Rodney at the time, all those guys. That where was, did your love for music come from? From my dad. My dad's a. Uh, He's got that creative yeah. flow. Yeah, yeah. He, he had the creative uh, the aspect to our family. Um, he. Artist, songwriter, vocalist, um, yeah, that's that's his thing. Um, so um, my fame with the music, or my role, my role to fame in the music space was, I had uh, placements on uh, national TV uh, channels or networks, you say. Mm -hmm. um, MTV was my first placement. Remember uh, Real World Real World Real World Challenge? Did you ever watch that? No, no, I don't. Real no. World? I do know Real, real World. Real World Real World Challenge. I okay. can't say that together really fast. Nice, but. yeah. It sounds like <laughs> the after. But um, but yeah. So they basically take those two worlds and bring them together, and they challenge each other in doing different stuff. Okay. So um, when the ne next season came up, and uh, my uh, publicist was like, uh, yeah, so. We got a place. It should hit on this season, and I didn't realize it'll be the first trap or the first music instrumental to get them ready for their first challenge together. So when I saw that on TV, I was like, "Oh, it's, yeah, I'm gonna be big." Yeah, I don't know if I was gonna be big, but I was like, "That was that was just a moment in time." It's like, wow, national TV. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And then um, 
Unique Whips on the Speed Channel had the opening track to uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Remember that on the Family Channel. Um, so yeah, I had several placements on my other TV. But. Yeah, so along your journey, as you <coughs> found, you had the, the creative bone from your dad, mm -hmm. and then you found the level of success in the music industry. So what was it that changed, that, that, made, it, that made you pivot in your career? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I woke up one day and the love for music wasn't there. Mm. Um, and it just be for various reasons. Um, I think it was just, in my spirit, it's just a time for a shift. You know what I mean? It's like, God's like, all right, I took you as long as I wanted to take you down this path. Now it's time to move you towards um, where where I needed to be at that time. So, <clears throat> so um, I got this job, which I just shared with you. Um, okay. After after much strife, <laughs> them moving to Atlanta, barely getting an apartment and so forth, and trying to figure out how I'm gonna pay my first month's rent. But um, <clears throat> but uh, did you come on like a, a wing and a prayer? Cause there's 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 a, you woke up one day and you and God told you, hey, this is far as I'm taking you on this path, right? And it's it's easy to boil it down to that. Yeah. But what was what was coming up for you in this time? Rent. <laughs> Rent. <laughs> Got gotcha. you. So you're up. you're doing these national programs, <laughs> but at the same time, you're not making rent. Well, yeah, so I mean, that was my first, that was my, this is so, let me back up. That, that moment of me moving to Atlanta in 2006, mm -hmm. right, it was me wanting to, me preparing myself for opportunity in Atlanta at a studio in Midtown, mm -hmm. which never came to fruition, right, for various reasons. And then my equipment got stolen and I got stored over there because uh, we were going to set up a production room as part of his uh, whole service offering. Uh, anyway, so that's a whole long story and stuff. Anyway, and then um, that that just didn't come to fruition for me. So um, the next the next opportunity was um, was getting into Jane Voices, right? So I called a guy who wanted to hire me previously, but I just wasn't in a position to be hired because I lived in one of at the time. Okay. And so uh, I hit him up and I was like, hey, you guys have anything available for me? Robert Feldman. <clears throat> He's like, actually, we do. And this guy was moving back to Orlando and a spot was coming open to him. So he said, like, when can you start? I was like, tomorrow. <laughs> if it's available. He's like, yeah, come in tomorrow. So went in and the rest was kind of history. And then through that, through me starting a full time job and still, you know, whatever I. I created back then with music mm -hmm. was still kind of percolating in the, in the industry and that's when that placement happened for me mm -hmm. with MTV and stuff like that so um, and then you know ASCAP pays out every 90 days so who's ASCAP? ASCAP is a publishing company gotcha so you get royalties <laughs> yeah so they, so they, they track it. yeah they track they track it so that's boiled down right now I don't I don't that's the it's, it's, so yeah I think the last time I probably seen a candidate was probably five years ago. Okay. It rolls down after a while, so unless you keep at it. Mm -hmm. But it might pop up every now and then for international play or whatever the case is. It mm -hmm. pop up, but. Mm -hmm. Are you a pretty spiritual guy? I'm grounded in that way. Yeah. yeah. You said that, you know, in my, I'm not sure if it's in, like, in hindsight, like God mm -hmm. decided that this was no longer the path. But you went from like cool music career. This is externally, right? This yeah, is yeah, all yeah. from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. To going to a nine to five. Yeah. Like, where? What was your mindset around like working a nine to five versus like following your dream at, at this time? Was there any dissonance that you experienced during that time? No, I saw it as just a new, uh, a new phase of life. Mm -hmm. That um, I was at a point where I just I felt like I just needed to be able to take care of myself. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like. You grinded, you grinded, you grinded, you know what I mean? You slept on floors, you did this, you did that, you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. when does, and then, I mean, I had to keep a roof over my head, you know what I mean? It's only me. And this apartment is only like I had like two or three different roommates where I could be like, hey, I'm gonna come through at some point, you know, just hold it down. It's mm -hmm. just me. So, yeah. um, so I, it was just a conscious decision that, you know, let me, let me go down this path and, you know, see what I can get out of it. But when I did, I was like, I get five years. 
You give it five years. Yeah, you decided five years. before you went in, you were going to give it five years. Yeah, I was like, I'll give it five years. I get on my feet, do what I need to do. Because, you know, I always had this entity of always creating for mm-hmm. myself. Right? Mm-hmm. So, wonder, so let me give it five years. <laughs> I'll be in like 13 years. Right. But, um. How did that happen? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I guess, you know, from the first two, wait, so I got the 06. I bought my home within that time frame. Okay. So I got into that. I bought my first home. Started, yeah. start, started seeing some success. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Feeling so, like the man. You got your, yeah, your first yeah, home. Yeah, I got my first home. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that happened within the first five years. And then I went into a sales role. Gotcha. So I went from being in a dungeon in production, mm-hmm. doing editing and recording of audio, to being in the front of the house, um, being front facing with customers and making sales. And I never really saw myself in a sales capacity, but I started looking at the other sales guys and it's like, that's what they do. I don't have to do that, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, mentally, uh, of course, in myself that I could uh, elevate to another experience. And I'm always about challenge, too. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, challenge and, you know, staying challenged and challenging myself is always, you know, pinnacle to um, whatever success I've had. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I got into the sales role. They needed a sales guy. So in another situation, sales guy was moving out. Needed a sales guy, and I raised my hand and it was like, "Well, I wish you would have told us this about twelve months ago." Blah blah blah. Why? Uh, why twelve months ago? Well, <clears throat> I guess they felt that I was capable. They they already thought you were capable. Yeah, you just didn't see it. Right. Right. Isn't um, that? I feel like that's the thing where we oftentimes we undercut ourselves and yeah. what we think our gifts are. Right. So I think. By the time you raise your hand, it, it would be nice if we had managers who like pluck us up and say, hey, <laughs> let's let's test you out in this role. Right. But unless you speak up, unless you like have some type of right. agency over your right. career, you could literally <laughs> float around and do some stuff that you have no interest in for the rest of your life. Yeah. So um, I got in a sales role and I, I, I love the hunt of it. I love the, the getting after it and just, you know, making the deals happen. You know, yeah. and forming the relationships, most importantly. Mm-hmm. You know, and creating these win-win scenarios where I have something that you need, you love it, I gave you great service, and you continue to come back and get it. You know what I mean? So, um, I like that aspect of it. And then it really kind of put me into that entrepreneurial spirit. That's what it was feeding, was mm-hmm. my entrepreneurial spirit, right? Um, of just being able to, you know, be in the hunt for, uh, for new food, I guess. So, you keep saying so. hunt. When I used to work at uh, in corporate, I, that was the one thing I just didn't understand. It's like, why would someone want to work commission? That sounds like torture. <laughs> like one, you have to like figure out what your salary is going to be every other week. You have to go after it. Like, and the funny thing is, I didn't look at myself like right. if I had seen myself at, at that point, right. or if I could talk to someone who had that conversation, right. I would probably say, listen. Everything you're saying is contrary to like a better life, right? Because yeah. for me, now that I know how to do like more so sales and stuff, I feel like once you know how to get your food and go catch it oh, and yeah. you bring you it in, right, and you'll never be the same. Yeah, so in your specific, uh, you know, um, journey in sales, what would you say was like the most challenging about it? Because I know that was, I feel like at the time I just didn't like it. And now I'm like, oh, it's, it's actually pretty cool. But I feel like I've never experienced it in a corporate perspective. Most challenging was um, getting those bigger clients that you desire mm-hmm. to be part of your portfolio, customer base, right? Mm-hmm. Getting those big logos, logos like Amex, which I eventually got. Um, they're international, um, the international side. I was never really able to tap into the... Um, the U.S., but uh, we got international. Um, yeah, so some some of those bigger players, Amazon was kind of a pie in the sky. I think we did a little bit of work with them, but not really get their core business. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I enjoyed those challenges, but as those challenges were coming, our business was also evolving mm-hmm. too. And uh, leadership didn't see it that way, but I saw it like. 
when I first got started in sales, it's like going to the end customer was like, that was the thing. Mm -hmm. you know, set up a professional service agreement with those guys, end customer, but they didn't realize that the end customer was just like them at the business that every October, November, they're assessing budget for the next year, mm -hmm. right? And because it's voiceover, they're like, well, we just spent $30,000 in voiceover this year. How about we cut that budget and spend it in this department and have Betty up front do the voiceover and we just set up a little mic something in the, <laughs> in the conference room and have her do it, you know what I mean? Yeah, so... Do we uh, really need that to be professional? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it became more of a question than mm. more of a necessity because mm. technology was changing, you know, TTS, such as the uh, text-to-speech stuff, was becoming more prominent. Mm -hmm. um, AI was coming into the into the space as well. Um, like, I had Microsoft read my emails this morning. It's like, you can't tell if it's a robot or a person because it's so, um, I don't want to say eloquent, but it's so um, natural in the yeah. way the speech happens that, you know, you can't really tell a difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, where before, it's very still. You know what I mean? And it didn't have the different inflections in the voice and so forth. So the business was changing. And so my sales tactic was I'm going to go after all the partners that have the big platforms that could sell into these bigger customers, mm -hmm. right? So um, that was my way. That was my strategy of keeping my, uh, my commissions going. And they really kind of did all the work for me on the front end. Mm -hmm. I just made sure that Jim Voices Voices were on their platforms when they rolled out. And they, they maintained contracts with um, three to five years, right, with the customer. Mm. So. so you're a back of the house guy. You go into sales, mm -hmm. and then you take to it like water. But what was it about you that made it a success? It's just my uh, means of uh, creating uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I think relationships, especially in the sales field, is because people want to be able to know that you got their back and they can trust you. Mm -hmm. You're not just out there to kind of get them or you have a one-minded agenda of just making a sale and then forgetting about it, right? So um, I think my way of being able to just craft relationships was uh, was uh, a good piece of my success there. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, um, you've been at the company for 13 years, yeah, was, still in sales? Yeah, so I started in sales 2011, so it took five years to get there, three years in production, then I was two years in sales support, and then... 2011, uh, I was the actual business development guy. Okay, I'm, I was trying to do the math, but then you lost me when you threw an odd number, so I can no longer count by the evens. I was like, okay, well, let's just say yeah. we made, yeah. we made it 13. Yeah. Okay, so at this point, um, you find that you're good at sales, yeah. you're developing relationships. And I'm actually kind of um, interested in your like in your perspective of like relationship building. Mm -hmm. um, I think I feel like B two C is different than B two B, right? It is. It's hugely different, for sure. Do you feel like you're more comfortable with B two B as opposed to B two C, or do you feel like you just know the lay of the land? You would know how to adapt. I'm definitely more comfortable B two B. Yeah. Um, Why is that? I think just the end customer, or just the you know the end customer, they're so fickle, right? Mm -hmm. And they could be they could be moved one way or the other, right? Um, versus B2B, the business that you're working with has an agenda and plan in yeah. place. So um, they're going to work that plan and invest the dollars to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And you're just a component to um, that pursuit. You know what I mean? So, hmm. And if you fit into that plan, then it all works out. <clears throat> so B2B, they have a plan. You, you're you able to kind of talk more format, like formally, right? Mm -hmm. But then as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. going out to B2B clients, I feel like as an entrepreneur, things aren't as structured. So I'm going back to <laughs> you saying like, um, back to the naivety comment, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, if I, if I did, if I had done the research, things like that, then yeah. I would have handled it a certain way. I feel like we are less formal in entrepreneurship and it's less planned and it's less research. Um, you kind of shoot from the hip more. Do you feel like your like your ability to, or do you feel like what you learned in the corporate space allows you to be more structured in entrepreneurship, or do you feel like it's been like mm -hmm. a bit of a hindrance in your relationship building as an entrepreneur? No, I yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was also on MLMs as well. Oh, um, so that also helped 
that also helped um, me build the confidence of just talking to people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just talking to people in general. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we were at a point where, you know, you go to a stranger and just have a conversation with them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a skill set. You know what I mean? Not everyone you just, you know, let me turn you around, talk to that person. Mm -hmm. The top three responses that I get when I ask, why do you want to leave corporate America? Are that you want financial freedom, you want to own your own time, and you want to build a legacy for this generation and generations to come. Now, this is not a solo job. In order to transition from your nine to five into entrepreneurship, it's going to take community and it's going to take resources. And I've created the community of pioneers who are going to wrap around you and help you make that transition successfully. So if you're interested in leaving your job, go ahead and click that information below. Let's get into the community and let's transition from your nine to five into entrepreneurship successfully. Now, let's get back to well, the episode. Um, uh, so. So definitely having that, you know, and that, I'm going to go back to the spiritual part because I believe life is a journey. And just because you went to school to go become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it is that you want to become, that doesn't mean that's the end game to where you will end up in life. You know what I mean? Um, so I could look at my life and say, up to this point and say, every, all my terms has set me up to be at this point of where I'm at today, right. you know what I'm saying? Through, you know, the music and the challenges of, you know, and the grit it takes to be in the music business, right? To get, get into MLM and the grit and, um, and the commitment it takes to do that, to the structure of being in the nine to five and, um, you know, learning how to formalize emails and be professional and stuff like that. Um, work spreadsheets and Microsoft tools and, you know, all those things that people don't may take for granted, you know what I mean? But when you are doing your business, the less you know, the more you pay for it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, <laughs> and if you're if you bootstrapping, you know what I'm saying? Like you gotta you gotta try to keep as much of that money to yourself and be able to execute on all those things as much as possible without having to get an external resource for it. You know? So, yeah. so at the point where you reach out to <clears> your dad. And you're like, hey, dad, how can I help? And you said all the discontents <laughs> came out. <laughs> Number one, what did he tell you was the problem? Well, you know, in business, it's always going to be two things. It's going to be money or the people you work with. Mm -hmm. You know, so in his case, it was the people that he's working with. But um, I love my dad to death, but he's not a business guy. You know what I mean? He's a creative. Um, that's kind of been his lane all his life, right? Um, so, um, I guess a more seasoned me would have dissected the situation a little more thoroughly, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I, I went into it with a lot of heart and feeling and emotion, right? Versus, um, versus taking all that out of it and saying, all right, well, let's open this up and dissect what is going on with the business or whatever this concept of the project is mm -hmm. and what kind of cash does it take to launch a brand um you know what are all the different distribution channels and you know um resources required just to have a successful launch mm -hmm. is Atlanta Georgia a successful place to launch a brand or should we do it in New York City or Florida or South Carolina don't know right so um, all these different um, things to play out to really kind of understand um, how to maximize your success. Because mm -hmm. being a business is about, you know, you either crash or burn. There's no like break even. I mean, people use the word break even, but there's really no, there's really no break even in business. It's either you're successful or you're not. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so you're bright eyed, bushy tail. Of course, if you know, if you had the business ac acumen, you, you could, yeah, yeah. you would approach it differently, and it would be more structured, and perhaps like with the level of experience that you have right now, with, like some you know fifty thousand dollar consultant to come in for a couple of weeks and <laughs> and make you guys go di right, you know distribution right. and make it look nice. But you had a vision, you had an idea, right. you had the passion, you had the heart. Right. What was it that you thought you were going to bring to your dad's business that he said, okay, yeah, come on in, I want you to help me. I don't know. Mm. That was all to be discovered, you know? Mm. So, um, in this space, it's very easy, in the liquor space, it's very easy to go to a uh, 
consultant company to do all your formulation, resourcing of vendors, do basically everything. And you just focus on sales and marketing and be the face of your brand. I explored all those avenues and made my one of more money than I was able to get, right? So um, basically it forced me to go learn everything about my supply chain, touch all those guys, understand what it takes to, you know, um, build my vendor uh, management list out, right? Yeah. And uh, basically, you know, lead times because nothing happens fast in this industry when it comes to materials and stuff like that. Everything is always at least minimum two months, if not three months. And now with COVID happening, that yeah. went to four to six months. Yeah, yeah. You know, so nothing happens fast. And I come from a space where, oh, you need something? Yeah, we can make it happen, blah, 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 blah. You know, very customer-centric, very customer-oriented. Um, this industry, not yeah. at all. So, um, and I get peeped at that. I'm like, man, if I had this thing, what I would do, blah, blah, blah. Like, I would shut all you guys down just from a customer service level. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, yeah, so, I mean, and you count on all of them in order for you to create revenue for yourself. You know what I mean? It's not like I could go stand up a plant for every single one of these things, right? Yeah. Like, you count on all of them to ultimately create revenue for your company. So, um, highly important to uh, understand that vendor management piece of things. Yeah. Now, you said um, in business, you know, it's kind of success and <laughs> fail, right? Yeah. But you guys have been running Iron John for a bit. Yeah. So instead of like, so it's not a colossal failure, but I'm sure there have been like highs and lows in the process. So when you think, <laughs> so when you think about some of those lows, like what was the, one of the biggest lumps you took on the head and like trying to develop Island John? I still got many lumps. It's still <laughs> healing. You know, see? Got married lumps on my head. Um, I just remember, I just remember going to bed at night and feeling this. <sighs> I can still hear it in my ear. It's not there, but, and it was just my heart rate and my stress level was just through the roof, right? Of, I'm gonna pay my people. I'm gonna get some more money. <laughs> um, how we can get some more product, you know, like everything. And on top of that, how I'm gonna get money to my household, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So, uh, so yeah, it was uh, many nights where that, Pulse in my ear was just, you could just hear the blood just pushing through. Right? Um, uh, thankfully, I don't have that anymore, or it's not as often <laughs> as it was. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those, those, were the, those were the battles, those were the stress of uh, business and just um, uh, managing that, managing that stress um, is highly important. I'm talking about mental health is like a thing now. Absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, 2020 was, especially when COVID hit, was, it was, uh, it was huge um, because, you know, I was courting some investors at the time and um, thankfully one, one stuck with me, but um, yeah, we were running out of money quick and product wasn't moving at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people would think that because, um, <clears throat> because the retail Basis was doing very well, um, that we would be doing well too. And that wasn't the case. It's just people shift their buying habits to they want to discover new things to, oh, I'm going to buy this bigger bottle of Jack Daniels, or I'm going to buy this bigger bottle of Tito's, or whatever. Mm -hmm. so everything was bigger, bigger, better, and also in plastic. You know what I mean? So, uh, so uh, pantry hoarding was also a thing. Yeah. All right. Um, and digital sales is also a thing. Can you buy Island John digitally? <clears throat> so now you can, and we didn't really kind of get into that digital space until um, until September, October of last year with okay. uh, PreserveBar.com. How much money do you feel like you guys lost with like going into it in September versus like March when everything like hit? Ask me a question one time. You said you guys started in digital like September, October. Yeah. Of last year, 2020, right? Yeah, yeah. And the pandemic for most of America, right, <laughs> not the world, started right. about like March. Right. So like, do you feel like that was kind of slow to move to digital? And do you feel like you lost any money in that process? Well, um, the digital space didn't really kick off for us 
you know, it just it allowed people to purchase us online. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so it wasn't like a huge boom because again, it's a it's a um, it's a space that you still have to dedicate resources to in order to build the build the awareness and the trend for it. Mm-hmm. But um, we we're very much in the retail stores once uh, Governor, Governor Kemp was like, uh, we're going to open phase one. And I was like, great. So I was in the stores um, relentlessly. I was at the point where I didn't care what, uh, I didn't care if there was a guy living outside. You know, I don't care if there was two of them outside blowing fire. I was like, we're going to get some Iron John people's hands. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the team that I was also building top of the year, I sent everyone along, you know, saying, hey, I don't know what's going on with this COVID thing. Maybe we did it, you know, just give it three weeks, see what's going on with the news, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't able to get any of those guys back. So okay. it was just me and a longtime friend of mine, Bashar, down in Middle Georgia. And he helped out as he could down there. And um, so it was just me and him in the market. And every weekend I was just out there, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies, I call it. Doing what you had <laughs> to do, and doing what I had to do, and um, we looked at uh, we looked at our inventory in May. And said, all right, well, based on historical data, we had about ninety days of inventory. Mm-hmm. The inventory was gone in like three weeks. Really? As soon as the government <laughs> camp opened yeah, up, so the inventory from uh, last week in April yeah. to um, just before Memorial Day weekend or mid mid May, we were out of product. Online sales only, or well, no, just in our because uh, we were just in Georgia primarily. Mm-hmm. Right? And this is so. April of 2020 or April 2021? 2020. Got it. 2020. So, so now I'm understanding. Um, you guys started digital in um, September, October, but you guys had gone out of inventory in the top of the year, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was we we had some inventory left over that. He was like, all right, do we pull the trigger on getting more inventory now? We don't really know how the market's going to react, you know, mm-hmm. but just based on historical data, we had about 90 days of inventory. Right? Mm-hmm. So um, as soon as I got out there and then Rashad down in Middle Georgia, we were able to deplete what we had in the warehouse, of, which was 90 days supply, and then what we had at our uh, distiller down in uh, distillery down in uh, Newport Ritchie. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had about nine days supply and all that junk was gone mm. for the week. So here we are, I'm on the phones firing up the supply chain, like, all right, I need bottles and like emergencies. Nothing in the industry happens fast, right? And then this was a new vendor we were working with up in Ohio and it took I wanna say twelve weeks. Gotcha. Week. Yeah, so, oh. and on top of that, two or three weeks was identifying the, the because uh, they send you a sample of what the final production output's going to be, right? So, it took them two to three weeks to do that. I had to send back the one that I liked the most of them. So, it was this whole to-do, and then it took another week or two for it to actually go into the production line, and then, um, it was just crazy. So... <laughs> So, so about 12, were, 13 weeks, and then we didn't have product back in market. We got on production line at the distillery um, almost mid-August. Gotcha. So we didn't ship to um, we didn't ship to Georgia until almost September, mm-hmm. right? So from mid-May to almost September, we are kind of depleted. Yeah. Right? Um, but things are moving in the right direction. September we moved uh, I think uh, 800 cases. Mm-hmm. How much? How much <laughs> does that bring in in revenue, roughly? Well, that was the most we ever moved in kind of a three four week time period. Um, so so that I don't know. Let's call that let's call that sixty seventy thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So are you, are you celebrating yet? Or are you just like, okay, now we got to do this all over again? No, I'm breathing a little more. I'm breathing a little better now. Okay. That, that little swish in my ear has gone down, you know what I mean? But uh, but I'm, I'm uh, definitely uh, at a little, little bit more ease. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I'm happy inside that, you know, we're able to move that much product in a short period of time. And 
We're now going into O and D, which they call Q4 in this space, which mm-hmm. um, uh, October, November, December. Yeah, a long time since I've been in retail, <laughs> but I don't remember. <laughs> o and D. So, um, so in Q4 is the, that's the hot quarter where you know a lot of sales are happening. There's more activity in the market, more people gathering because yeah. of the holidays, mm-hmm. more you know. People that typically don't go to the liquor store now in the liquor store buying, you know, their favorite item for whoever, I don't know. Yeah. But um, there's just a lot more activity happening in the space, so. Um. That makes me think about in the beginning <laughs> and the top of the year when Corona kind of happened, y'all sold out of a nine uh, months, nine months or nine. So that was May. That was May that happened. Um, right. But top of the year, we couldn't move more than 20-something cases. Before Corona. That, that's, when, that's when it happened. When when the world when they said the world is shutting down yeah and then everyone was frantic and going to their local grocery store mm-hmm. or liquor store blah blah, blah. no one was picking up all the that's what I'm trying to figure out like I'm trying to figure out what what was going <laughs> on like why did it just sell out so fast because you would think in the beginning because we're in the market we were in the market we we're putting bottles in people's hands mm. then we weren't I mean we were starting to beginning of the year like January February right right. Well, I think January, we did zero promos in February, we got in the market. So we only had like really four weeks in the market. And granted, we're only, so 2018 was our first year, 2019 was our second year. You know what I mean? So we're really still very young. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. um, you get those uh, unicorn businesses, and we definitely look for one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you know, they go from zero to a hundred million dollars overnight, you right. know, but, um, we're very, we're still very much a baby in the business, you know. Yes. Um, still trying to turn over at this point. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, two years in the market, you know, not a lot of money um, that we were working on or off of. So we couldn't really spend a lot of money in social ads and stuff like that. It was mm-hmm. just, it was just a lot of boots on the ground and locking and tackling that we were doing. Got know? it. So it was boots on. It, so the spike in May. Mm-hmm. Was attributed to y'all going out there and really being guerrilla yeah. marketing, so oh, to speak. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Got it. Okay, bring for us sure. to the distribution issues, and then um, you get the sixty k month in September, which is lit. Yeah. We are now. I want to say a year past. So how has how has growth been in the business since then? Growth has been good. Um, I think our will to um, not be a casualty to COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, contributed to our success today in market mm-hmm. and um, I have to say we brought on at that time in October we brought on another person as well Tiffany who uh, is going to be our first hire next month um, so we brought on Tiffany and she really came in and she slammed up it for us well, what will we'll be her role is so she same, duplicate you yeah or? duplicate me yeah, yeah. Um, so she came in um, she was through a referral of another friend where I was like, was on the phone, kind of having a little disgruntled moment, like, man, I can't find somebody that, you know, and they're like, you know what? She's a little older, but I think you could count on her to support you. And she had a lot of energy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she came in. I don't think I, I even trained her. I sent her an email. We exchanged paperwork um, and uh, told her first us first two assignments and she came in and knocked it out the park. Yeah. 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 So I'm thinking about when you <clears> lost <throat> all your employees, like when Corona happened, right? Yeah. And I'm I'm sure that was difficult for a lot of people who had employees and yeah. couldn't pay them. Um and I'm also thinking about the culture that the opportunity for you to start fresh a lot right. of you build. Do you think about building Island John from a cultural perspective and what you want that internal culture to be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was just thinking about this the other day, just after listening to uh, some other podcasts and stuff, just about business and uh, uh, creating guidelines and uh, uh, purposeful guidance of what the company culture will be, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is that um, we won't do anything unless we feel like we can execute it at a time's level. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, just you know, when you uh, when you do something, you just do it with heart and with passion. And um, even at the stage of the company that I was listening to, where there are you know hundreds of millions of dollars, they still look for people that we don't want people that's coming in for like a paycheck. Mm-hmm. We want people to come in that 
uh, feel like they could be part of what we're growing and this legacy that they could potentially be part of. Right? Yeah. And um, that was, I uh, found that to be astounding um, that that thought process was still there to date. You know what I mean? Like someone small like me, you would like, we had that thought process, right? And just because we're small and mostly because, you know, we can't divvy out the salary that someone will demand for that, you know what I mean? So we want someone to come in with the mental mental fortitude and heart that, okay, yeah, I see what they're doing. I want to be part of it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, versus now I have the money to pay you what I want. So this is what I need you for. But the mindset is that I don't still, still I don't want you showing up just to get paid. I want you to be, you know, um, be all in to what we have going on here from a culture standpoint. Yeah, you know, so. yeah. And speaking of culture, I think um, your relationship with your customer has evolved. It, at oh, least, yeah, you know. Sure. So sure. when you think about like, you know, when we're talking about B2B sales versus mm -hmm. B2C sales, mm -hmm. understanding who your ideal client is, right. knowing what Island John does right. for your client. What would you say the relationship like with like how clients identify with Island John was before? Versus the identity or the connection that you're trying to develop with your client is right now. Um, I think customers that um, saw us early, um, early on, and I think this is just more human nature of seeing a person and or entity grow mm -hmm. and saying, hey, I bought their first bottle mm -hmm. and look at where they are today. You know what I mean? And still supporting that and still kind of indirectly being part of that journey, that legacy, that brand building process, right? Um, and feeling proud that see it's kinda of like seeing your uh seeing your son or daughter just, you know, you know, they they've been swinging T ball back and then now they're able to hit a home run and like, wow. Yeah. From where you started to where you're at today, that's awesome. You know what I mean? So I think um that connection has just kind of uh, grown stronger um, just because, you know, obviously through their help, we have a lot of fans out there. And uh, fortunately, I get a lot of their uh, their texts and their emails and um, social media DMs of, nice. of uh, you know, how much they enjoy the product. And I met a lady the other day um, in one of our key accounts up in Gwinnett called Mega Package. And um, the security guy was in there. And hopefully I don't get too emotional about it, right? But I met him at another store in um, in Towers. He was the security guy there. We met for the first time, and he came up to me. He's all like, "Yeah, I heard about this product, Justin." And he didn't know who I, I was at the time. I was setting up a little promo, and um, what was gratifying about it is that he was regurgitating the story that the person told him mm -hmm. about Alan and John, right? And that's and that's really what brand building is about. That you want people to become spoke models for your brand, you know what I mean? And um and then I introduced myself to him. He's like, oh man, it's like oh, oh shake my hand, nice to see you, nice to meet you, blah blah blah. And then suddenly I saw him again at Mega Package package and he told me he's like, dude, you inspired me to um go out and do my own my own thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? After meeting you at the store there, you inspired me to do my own thing. So I opened my own security business up and you know hopped out here. And um as I was in the store because I spent a couple hours in there, a uh, lady came up. He brought me a lady, a customer. And he's all like, I told her if I ever see you again that I will make a personal introduction to you. And he told me about it. This lady, every time she comes in the store, she does not leave without a bottle of bottle John. And uh, she went on to tell me, like, yeah, I'm a huge fan of you guys. I have, I've been ever since, I don't know, a couple years ago. I've been buying my my husband's hooked on it, and uh, we don't really buy anything else But I'm done. Every time I come in here, I'm always picking up a bottle of wine. So, um, uh, she says she has people in Michigan that she sends bottles to. Wow. Yeah. So, um, that's not the first time I heard that. I ran into a guy over in West Cobb that says he sends bottles to his, uh, his guys in, um, where is it, uh, I don't want to say Wisconsin, but some mid Missouri, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, he sends bottle off, off to people in Missouri, um, and I've heard of people saying they send bottles to their people in DC or Pennsylvania. So, 
uh, or in and or New York. And now we have a spot in New York where people go buy it. But um, but yeah, so there's been stories over the journey that you know customers reaching out like, yeah, man, I love your product, blah blah blah. I got my sister hooked on it, or I got my aunt or my cousin or whoever, blah blah blah. And I send bottles to them all over the country. You know what I mean? So it's like it's awesome. It's awesome knowing that you know you produce something and people enjoy it. That's amazing. Yeah. So from a quantitative <clears throat> perspective, because uh, I love stories, my heart is is super open for it, but sometimes I forget about the business, right? I get so <laughs> sucked into like the impact mm -hmm. and the people that I forget about the revenue, but let's not forget. So success comes both in the yeah. impact as well as the, yeah. the dollar. So you've had um, more than 12 consecutive months of like being like in the zone, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. So how much would you say in revenue, like with these stories and that they've contributed to in terms of your success? Um, so we probably was around, we doubled, we doubled every year as far as- Let's we, go! We so um, we've had some outages this year. Okay. Um, unfortunately, and praying to God that, you know, we don't have the next year because when you have outages, those those kind of defeat your potential of what mm -hmm. your outcome could be, right? Yeah. So, from a distribution, um, it was distribution. Distribution, yeah. This distribution, just inventory availability. Inventory. Right? Okay. So, gotcha. um, so we should be, um, we should be probably about. We'll be over three thousand cases this year. We probably would have done around four thousand mm -hmm. without those outages. We just we're now coming up. Overcoming our third outage, which should happen this week, coming week. Mm -hmm. um, so inventory that would put us about, let me see, or uh, revenue that put us about, let me see, that put us at close to over three hundred. Three hundred thousand or so. Congratulations! Congratulations! Yeah. So we were to go back to the day where, and it doesn't sound like your dad was a hard sell, but you're a sales guy now, <laughs> and you know more. You know more, and yeah. you know exactly what you built yeah. and building, continuing, right. continuing right. to build. So if you were to go back and talk to your dad, right? Mm -hmm. With what you know right now, <laughs> what is it that? How would you sell? How would you position that sale? What would you tell him that you're going to build? Well, I'll tell my dad I'm like, dude, without the cash to really do this thing, you can't do it, you know. Um, but that would be the practical me, right? Um, the all-in Kevin me, the risk taker would be like, yeah, let's do it and we'll figure it out later, mm -hmm. you know, which which is what happened. Um, because, you know, I, uh, and I wholly believe it. And... You know, although those those rough patches came and those kind of emotional traumas kind of happened, um, you know, it, it's always um, it's an over, it's always to overcome to become, right? So when anytime you can overcome something, you become something because of what you've overcome. So um, uh, you know, it's it's part of um, character building. It's all part of uh, of you know building that story for somebody because if you never go through it you can never tell anybody that i was able to overcome it you can't do it Absolutely. you know what i'm saying so um that's part of that storytelling and you know inspiring somebody to uh keep moving forward mm -hmm. i love it now I, I love some of the biggest like motivational speakers and some of them that i love so i come from corporate i yeah. grew up middle class yeah. um I, did, I identified with like uh, volunteering and things much later on in my life, like mm -hmm. in terms of social economic issues and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I had a struggle, but I've identified the things that keep me going. Yeah. So when you talk about the ETs of the world eating out the trash can and <laughs> and those things, right? I don't have that story, but I do know what drives me. Mm -hmm. I don't. I never had a syrup sandwich in the hood, but I know that I <laughs> no, don't want you it. it. No. It's super dope. So my yeah, question you is: put the syrup on the bread and then you toast it, and man, what? Listen, you know, you sound like you know a thing oh. or two, right? So my question <laughs> to you is: when you think about like everything that you have overcome, as you mentioned, like what is that thing that always kind of keep? What's the thing that fuels that battery in your back? If it's not a syrup sandwich or eating out the trash can, what's your syrup sandwich? Um, just the name. Boom. What what instance back in your childhood, young life, <laughs> did you ever go back 
do you go back mm-hmm. and do you realize like um that was then this is now and also you're a dad yeah. like there are things that you have experienced that I'm sure you want to create a different or a better oh, life yeah, for your for kids. Sure, for sure. So and we have. have. We have, for sure. Um, so what's that thing for you? Hmm. Uh, well, because the battery in my back is naysayers. Um, definitely those that don't believe. You know, creating believers out of those that don't believe, for sure. Um, uh, I have definitely, you know, I'm an Aries, so I have a competitive spirit in me. Um, and yeah, just getting to a, a lifestyle that um, that is purposeful mm-hmm. and that um, inspires others to be able to say, yeah, I should go do that too. Um, uh, philanthropy is definitely uh, part of or has been part of my journey as well. Um, so creating and or being involved in organizations that are doing really good things in the world. Um, you know, so um, those are those are some of the points we're gonna probably we're gonna try to focus on. You know, um, God willing to be able to put some kind of programming around that. Um, but uh but yeah and then you know legacy as well, you know. Um, I feel that everyone has a purpose on this earth, whether good or bad, mm-hmm. um, and to be able to find it and discover what that is, um, I think is a huge one, and then also walking and living in that purpose, because mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of people that are afraid to either take that leap of faith and um, believe that, you know what, um, that looks good, but I'm safe here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think God created us to be safe um, because that's where faith comes in. You know what I mean? Like, um, you're safe havens with Him, not with what you create mm-hmm. as a safe haven. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's still so much to do. So. Yeah, so much work to do. I think you're right. Um, speaking of pat, uh, purpose and taking the leaps, right? Mm-hmm. And I love how you put that when you said, that looks good, but I'm comfortable here. Right. For a lot of my clients, I'm helping them understand, like, because a lot of people that I, I'm in my circles, right. you know, come from syrup sandwiches, we don't come from, like, those <laughs> tough situations, we intentionally have to decide to put ourselves in, like, uncomfortable positions. Right. And so when we're transitioning from corporate to entrepreneurship, as a single woman, I can make that decision for myself because right. my worst case scenario is different from your worst case scenario. Right. So at the time when you decided to make your leap, where were you at personally? Did you already have a family or were you still oh, a single yeah. man? <laughs> what was that like? Cause I can't. Oh man, we got another hour, we got another hour. <laughs> <laughs> time is yours. Oh, we are your time. Oh. Well, yeah, so I uh, just bought a new house. So mortgage doubled, <laughs> um, and then family expanded by one because we've already had my first son at that time, and Jaden was in the picture. And so, uh, yeah, I had a lot going on personally that would have checked all the boxes of no, that, yeah. that uh, it wasn't a good time for me to do it. But um, I was being... I, w- I was emotionally tormented by where I was at in my job. And maybe I didn't give enough um, leeway for the spiritual aspect to kind of really do what it needed to do. Because, you know, I, I and I, I try to be as patient as possible, right? And the way I left my job, I spoke to leadership. I was like, look, this is where I want to go. Um, this is what I want to do ultimately. Um, and they gave me a six to 12 month runway um, to do that and mm-hmm. still have somewhat of a paycheck coming through that. Uh, through that. And uh, so when Jan 1 hit of 2019, I was all over the place, just trying to find out where I could spark a fire. 
I went to Savannah several times, went to Augusta several times, Columbus, North Georgia. Um, but uh, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was, I wouldn't say scared. Um, I, I was probably maybe a little overconfident mm. uh, that I could have done something to, um, in a short period of time, to make up the income that I was making. And not only which I, I fell on that sore several times, mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, I I I was I wasn't uh, financially we were good, you know. I tend to remind my wife we have a a, a full time professional salary and savings, you know what I mean. But uh, from a woman's perspective, it's, it's it's not to be spent on your endeavors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's that's my that's that's if you know the house comes crashing down and emergency. You know, like, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so what was it like then? You weren't happy in your role. You had a conversation with the <clears throat> leadership. They gave you twelve months of a runway, but then you had to go home and have this real conversation. Yeah, I did. It was very rough. Um, and um, you know, she was she was frightened by it. And not knowing the unknown, because mm -hmm. you know you don't want to know what it's like. What's that look like? Mm -hmm. And really, I was at a space where I was like, especially getting started with my dad. This was where so 2018 is our first year in market. I worked a full time job during that process. Okay. Um, and um, so just to kind of see if this is gonna happen, Alan John's gonna happen, still kind of keep home whole. I mean, not really just dive as much as I wanted to. Um, and then, you know, 2015, when I was going down the process with my dad, you know, I didn't really know what was going on. You know, I was like, I'm still discovering myself. I can't explain nothing to you if I don't know what the heck is going on. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I'm like, yeah, you know, this. I, I, I'm intrigued by the industry, by, you know, the family business, but you know, I don't know what it's going to be, right? Um, so the conversation with my wife was very difficult. Um, you know, I, I definitely could have gone about it in a better manner mm -hmm. um, to maybe put her mind at ease of, you know, what I was going to do and go about it. But at the end of the day, regardless of what I could have said to you, do you believe in Kevin enough to be able to go out and do what he said he's going to do? Ooh, can, you know can I mean? I, don't leave me hanging now. <laughs> listen. You know what I mean? So regardless, <laughs> regardless of, you know, however the message came across, yeah. is do you believe in me enough to say, all right, I believe in you enough to go out and execute whatever you say you're going to go do? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, um, so, and that's, and from my perspective, that's how I looked at it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because, I could put all type of numbers in front of you, yeah. this and that, the other, and say, you know, I had a business plan in place, but even when I look back at the business plan, you wouldn't have trusted it based I mean, on what you know. The now. business plan doesn't equate to, you know, but we were looking at it from a million dollar type of investment, two million dollar type of investment versus, all right, we're going to strap up our, our bootstrap, we're going to go bootstrap the thing and make it happen. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, we had some money. We had some money that we were able to put into it and and uh, get from some loans and credit cards and stuff like that. But um, this industry takes so much money mm -hmm. for you to have a chance at success. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you could say you're the hardest grinder, whatever. You know what I mean? But that's just that's half of it. The other half is how much money can you get into the business because you got to turn over and burn a lot of cash. To mm -hmm. get to the point where you start making some money. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, from a family, from a family perspective, it was definitely wasn't ideal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say any other man that's not cut by the same cloth would probably tuck his tail and say, you know what, I'm just stick to this this job and you know make sure the family's good and mm -hmm. you know put my sword in. Still wet for mm. another day, you know what I mean? <laughs> you so. you talk about there's a nuance here. Um, there it's like your character. It's like 
you know, for leadership to be willing to give you 12 months of a runway says something. Mm. For your dad to be like, you know, not to really like push back on you coming to do business, that says something. Um, for you to be like, hey, well, I don't know if you said this specifically, like either you count on Kevin or not, but at the end of the day, you put enough social capital or relationship capital into your relationship for your yeah. wife to be like, okay, clearly we're still here and, you know, what? <laughs> so I'm curious what the like philosophies are that you live by if you know them like and what is it that kind of allows people to trust you in, in your word um i think just work ethic mm-hmm. you know um people if anything else if they don't believe in your word they believe in your work ethic mm-hmm. you know what i mean um mm-hmm. that, i think that stands more than anything that anyone can say it goes down to that old saying actions speak louder than words mm-hmm. Again, I could tell you and Salam Blue in the face that XYZ is going to happen, but until you can see evidence of that actually happening, you know, because uh, people want to be able to see it at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, so, work ethic and um, is, uh, and I think it's just pinnacle to uh, building that trust. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like, um, so work ethic, I'm going to take that answer, right? But I think there takes a little bit of savvy to make it out here. Um, that you, you just being authentic, you just gotta be authentic. You know? mm. um, be Are you authentic. pretty strategic in your relationships, though? Like, that's part of my that's part of my makeup, you know. It's yeah. like, you know, again, I think it goes back to that conversation of uh, being organized. Mm-hmm. I force myself to be organized to create an outcome, yeah, for something, right? Um, and so, um, strategically, you know crafting relationships so that there is a outcome, but not a mutual outcome that is beneficial for uh, both of us at the end of the day. And, you know, especially this industry because it's such a handshake industry. Yeah. Right? Although it's B2B, there's not a lot of paperwork that's being exchanged. You know, sign on the dotted line. You Mm -hmm. know, if you don't sign on the dotted line, you go to court or you, you know, go outside of that agreement. Mm. This is, uh, there's a lot of handshake. A lot of word and bond action yeah, going yeah, on. Absolutely. So, Interesting. Um, so sticking to sticking to that, and um, you know those guys, you know, seeing that you know you're you're a person of the word, um, and also through your work, seeing that that customer became a loyal customer of your brand, and yeah. they're continuing to buy it, and that gives them the self that gives them the. Um, the trust and comfort that okay, this brand might have something, you know, because yeah. I mean? at the end of the day, people don't want brands on the shelf that can sit there and collect dust and that they have to send their their stocking guy around with a little dusting thing to dust off every three months and wonder if they can live or not, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, so all those components just coming together, you know, build those uh, those solid relationships. That's beautiful. I think as it pertains to you building a family based brand. Um, you being able to maintain a relationship with your wife, maintain a relationship with your daughter. It's on a thread. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's on a thread. And the fact that you can be honest enough to say that, <laughs> right? And so this is not a relationship podcast by any means, right? right? But as a as a woman entrepreneur, I oftentimes wonder, like, what does it take for me to maintain a successful relationship with the, my partner, maintain a successful relationship with my mom, my mm-hmm. dad? Because for me, I can get siloed. I don't have necessarily any responsibility, however. Because there's no commonality between us. What do you mean? Well, you being a woman entrepreneur, just an entrepreneur in general, the thought process is different. Mm -hmm. You know, the the optics of life is different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we was taught to go to school, go get good education, go get good jobs, and retire. But no one told you that, um, well, What's it going to take for retirement? What what does retirement look like? Mm-hmm. Because they haven't got there themselves, right? Mm-hmm. So now they're in Walmart being a greeter to make up whatever extra money that Social Security's not giving them because they didn't save enough money yeah. to put away or they didn't take that ta- calculated risk to put them where they need to be financially so that they could go see their grandkids or go take this trip or, you know, you work 40 years out of your life really hard not to go be in Walmart to greet customers, you know what I'm saying? So my whole thought process is, you know, 
lifestyle. You know, could this business create the lifestyle not only for me, but for others? Because I tell my team all the time that, like, I'm not my successful unless it could feed your family and put you in the financial space that you desire. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's not about my family. You know what I mean? It's about the people we're able to impact because they got involved with that impact. Yeah. You know, so I just think, um, you know, uh, you in general, I think entrepreneurship is really just managing the average person. Yeah. Right? And I think that it's purposeful, right? Because imagine if the whole world was out from home, you know, like I had employees or, you know, stuff like that. You need someone to be able to come clean the house, wash the car, you know what I mean? Take care of all the other amenity type stuff so that because of, and Mentor told me this a while back, now, dude, not everyone has the same work ethic mm -hmm. and journey that you do, yeah. right? There's there's supporting cast members along the way, mm -hmm. right? And those are supporting cast members. So um, when you become, when you get in the element of other entrepreneurs and like-minded people, mm -hmm. then I think you're, that's your comfort zone, mm -hmm. right? Versus those that are and don't see like the same length as you do. Yeah. So when you say commonality, are you saying that, um, well, for my life, I know that there's, I would probably say I'm an outlier for a lot of my right. relationships that I've built along mm -hmm. the way. And I think the latter part of my life was a more entrepreneurial in terms of my social circle. Are you saying there's more, do you feel like there's more synergy in your life? Your dad, of course, is kind of like what sparked a lot of the junk. Mm -hmm. But then, um, like with, between your wife, mom, brother, sisters, like do you, is it more so entrepreneurial or is it more so a nine to five? Um... <laughs> So definitely with my wife, four nine to five. Um, uh, yeah, um, my brothers and sisters, I can't really speak to them um, as far as that goes. But I've attempted on many occasions to bring them into the fold of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm of the uh, everyone feels like in they have the right to bring their own opinion, right? But if you went to school to be a doctor and now you have your sister telling you how you should do operations but they never study a medical book, mm -hmm. then that will kind of come off weird or maybe offensive to you, right? So, but in business, it kind of really opens the realm because there's no study book, right? For yeah. entrepreneurship. So it kind of opens you up to opinions and People that say, oh, you should market this way, or you should go this way, go in this direction, this and the other. But when you live and breathe every aspect of this business and every day is a hard decision, do I go this way? Do I spend money on this billboard? Although I don't know if it's going to bring money back. You know what I mean? Like, how long would it take for me? All right, I'm going to spend $3,000 on this billboard. All that's going to get those eyeballs. Are all these stores around this area going to pick up the product? You don't know that. Yeah. So you can either spend three thousand dollars in that direction, or you can go to every single one of those stores and you can talk to them personally to make sure a product goes in the store. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's those kind of decisions, and then it's those kind of opinions that you're going to get that you're like, all right, well, you you know make a Teflon let oil let it be water off your back with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I've uh, I've attempted to bring those that I felt that have the skill set to offer or that I feel like I could build up to be part of the business. But um everything's timing too. You know what I mean? Maybe it's just not time for that. Hmm. You know, I'm so glad this this conversation circled back to content because I don't know if you see it, but I see it. <laughs> I mean, a three thousand dollar billboard, it's not so you said this before we started the the chat, and you were like, you're thinking from a business mind, and I understand what you mean now. One, because when I used to work in marketing, mm -hmm. uh, social media heads, marketing heads, the first to roll if it's layoff time, right? Because um, business people can't necessarily see the return on investment when right. it comes to uh, marketing dollars, um, and so that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But when we think uh, in entrepreneurship. It, to me, there's so many more, uh, there's a different range of like the way you can connect with your customer, yeah. and develop a brand story that like saves you way more money than like a $3,000 investment on a billboard mm -hmm. and that are more so organic and free. Yeah. 
So I would love for us to just talk really quick about, because we talked about the mission that mm-hmm. you're kind of developing in your company, the comfy mm-hmm. culture, mm-hmm. the connection that your customers have to the brand and how they feel tied to the brand story. And um, if you go to your social media, like the um, actual company social media, there's some good um, like content around like y'all doing events and things like that around the brand. But if we were to spitball things that your your ideal client, mm-hmm. you, you know about the ideal client, one mm-hmm. from B2B perspective, one mm-hmm. from a B2C perspective, what more, like what kind of things would your, your audience, your client like to see about the brand that would draw that connection and make it stronger that doesn't require a $3,000 billboard? <laughs> what I want to do is, um, from a content perspective, is... Uh, Create these little video series of my dad and I. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, him sharing his piece of his story of Alan John. Um, I'm sharing my piece of it. And just kind of create these, this, you know, I don't know how long the series would be, but um, create some content around that. I wanted to, okay, so I wanted to uh, do this uh, holiday commercial. But um, due to uh, uh, having to spend money in other directions because of uh, necessary needs, we have to pause that. Mm-hmm. But we're going to use a song that my dad did a while back. Um, when I say a while back, I think it predates me. Um, and it was with a, it was a song called You're My Star with a young Whitney Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Whitney Houston and Whitney Houston. And so we were going to, we we're going to use that as a soundtrack in this uh, holiday commercial. Um, but to, I wanted to preface that video content with the story of why we use the music track in that song, mm-hmm. right? And then, um, so from my dad's perspective and then, you know, from my perspective, um, because I have a different, he's going to tell it to you from his experience in the studio and then when Whitney Houston showed up and, and then I'm going to tell it when I was a, uh, three, four year old kid listening to this I think three, three and a half, four, you know, whatever the smaller vinyl records are, because that was the singles. And, you know, putting it on the record player and playing that song and hearing the, you know, the tune of that music come on and just being captivated. You know what I mean? Um, and I I mean I still play that play that song today and I it, you know, I still get transported back at that little kid when I hear it. So um, I wanted to uh, uh, kind of have some content, uh, kind of precursing that video so people get a, get a more type of a deep dive into the whole thought process of that mm-hmm. uh, soundtrack for me. So yeah. fortunately, we have to delay that. Yeah, well, the cool thing is that holidays happen every year. Yeah. And, sure. uh, you know, campaigns are planned 12 months ahead of time. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I love the fact that you were even willing to, like, voice that type of, like, creative energy because um, in this space, for me as a, I think, mini influencer, right. so to speak, right. content directly affects my bottom line. Okay. And so, because I can see it, it's less of, when I used to work in marketing from a data perspective, okay. so I've been in conversations where it's like, What's the value? Right. Two, I've seen it. I've seen it attribute uh, to dollars and bottom line revenue for me as okay. an influencer, or really just as a career coach when I'm able to go online or go live or something like that. Right. <laughs> but um, where the money really is is for people to truly buy into the brand, and it and mm-hmm. it to like social media has this like nucleus of energy that just makes sure. people want to buy, yeah, and sure. Sure. if they're truly genuinely tied to the brand, yeah. I think there is a way to forecast that type of um, brand recognition in a way that we haven't seen traditionally. So it's actually pretty cool. And with a a bit of creativity and like a will to Mm -hmm. like invest in that space, I think you'd be able to see a return on your investment in a cool way. So if y'all was watching this. sound like she over here trying to, you know, um, get a job over here. Well, what I I am doing (laughs) is for anybody watching right now, if you're a social media marketer, then you know exactly the vision that he is trying to create right now, and you know to shoot your shot. <laughs> so um, do what you got to do. <laughs> so I, I really have enjoyed your story. Um, 
from hearing you take the leap of faith from your job, mm -hmm. from you kind of building up as as an accountant from a musical perspective, which mm -hmm. we haven't even like did dove, dove yeah. into that. Um, but there's so much. So much to Listen, <laughs> and I would have you here all day because I, I have millions of questions that I could ask you. But um, from your making of a professional to you taking a chance to tell your dad, hey, let me. Let me help you out, right? Mm -hmm. And your dad's willingness to trust you and along the way you being able to like develop this relationship to even now, I just feel like it's a really cool like story and it's build up and you've evolved as a person mm -hmm. and the company's evolving as a brand and I would love to see more people like tell that story out loud. So as we think about your um, journey moving forward mm -hmm. and what you see for Ivan and John, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to like going for like in the next twelve to, to. I'm looking forward to hitting our mark of uh, ten thousand cases next year or so and beyond. Um, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge leap from where we are now. You know, mm -hmm. we've been just doubling over the last two years. Um, so this will kind of, kind of quadruple, double us. You know, um, which I'm, I, I think is possible. Um, but you know, it all comes down to making the right decisions. Um, at the right time. Yeah. And um, yeah, just uh, being able to see the brand evolve and gain more traction into the marketplace, um, bringing on our first employee. Yeah. Um, that's that's huge in terms of for us. You know, getting to a million dollar company um, is also just uh, you know something to definitely parade about because there's a. Uh, there's a stat out there that says less than one percent of companies under or over a million dollars brings, or I think under a million dollars um, brings on any W two employment. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And I wholly believe, as an entrepreneur, your duty to the community is to service your community through employment and to give those an opportunity to be a uh, a quality citizen in the sense of uh, they could go buy their first car or their dream car or buy their home through the means of whatever they have helped you build through your business, mm -hmm. right? And being able to give back to the community in that way through through employment. So I think uh, that's that's our as an entrepreneur, that's our marching mantra of uh, giving back for sure. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, and before we close out, I definitely could not have you not share a word of wisdom at, at any point in the journey because there's a lot of leaps that you've taken, a lot of, um, what's the word, uh, you've taken liberties, you know, with your own life, your own career, and it's actually really impressive. Um, and not, not a lot of us are doing it, at least in my circle. I'm not seeing it a lot, so I think it's actually pretty dope for someone who's sitting in a cubicle right now. Um, maybe, you know, they have a dad or someone who's doing something kind of cool too and they want to put some effort into it. What's that word of wisdom that you would reach back at your old self at any point in time and you would say, hey, this is what you need to know in order to move forward? Wow, that's a good question. Um, what would I tell my younger self? Um, oh, man. I think I've, I think I've made a lot of uh, good and bad decisions, but they're all kind of uh, risky stuff at the end of the day. So um, uh, I would say just, uh, I think there was a point in time where I pulled back on being my authentic self. And uh, I probably tell myself to uh, never do that again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because there was a point where I was like, I was my, I was, because business is always kind of me part of it. And I was like, no, I'm never going to get in the business if it's going to impact my personal life, impact me financially. This thing. As long as it's smooth sailing, I will do it. You know what I mean? That that made me a couch potato for whichever one. Mm -hmm. um, looking at a lot of uh, uh, marathons on TV and stuff like that. So, um, I think I would uh, tell myself to uh, continue to be true to myself and my purpose. I love it. I love it. And I feel like I connect with you a lot more now than I did before because I'm like, I know I hated sales. And I feel like sometimes I'm crazy for being like, 
I wanted something stable, but what you're telling me, you know, I, I really resonate with uh, that, you know, being your authentic self and not letting it become a couch potato. So, no, it's not. Uh, I think a lot of people need to hear that. So thank you so much no, for, for sure. joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your story. For thank listening you for having me. Absolutely. Thank y'all for listening. Thank you for watching. You. And if there is anyone out there, Kevin, who um, connects with your story, they want to patronize the brand or they want to just stay connected, how can they reach out to you? Uh, follow us first. We need more Instagram followers. So at Alan John Vaca. <laughs> Alan John Vaca. Um, uh, and you can go to www.alanjohn.com. Um, or if you want to order online, I'm sure your reach is beyond Georgia. So, uh, reservebar.com has us for sale. So, definitely uh, pick you up a bottle and um, rerun this rerun this whole thing so that, you know, you can taste the Island John, you can hear my words, and it all connects. We, we, we all drenched into the, the whole, whole Island experience. John spirit. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, y'all know what to do. Thank you so much <laughs> for watching. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'll see y'all next week. Peace out. Thanks a lot. Thank you.